Daniel chapter 6. Daniel's getting old. He's about 85, 90 years old now. Right around there. So we have a couple of characters we got introduced to last week, or at least one anyhow, that we more specifically got introduced to. Uh, just back up to verse 30 and 31. I uh, remember uh, in the last chapter we had uh, Belshazzar resting comfortably in what his grandfather had set up and provided and thinking that there was no chink in his armor, no way anybody could ever make it into his city. However, uh, because of two defectors from the Babylonian army getting out to Cyrus, letting them know that the river could be diverted because the Euphrates River ran through Babylon, uh, that they could divert that into a swamp above the town or above the city. They could get, come in under the gates then uh, in the water, which is what they did. So comfortable inside was Belshazzar that all of the gates or at least most of the gates of the inner wall, because it had two walls around the city, the inner wall were all open. Had they had those gates closed and been paying attention, they could have just massacred the Medes and Persians that they came through. They would have been trapped between the two walls. But they weren't doing that. Instead, he had his lords and wives and concubines and had a big party and weren't paying attention to anything and just thought they were completely impervious. They had had all the provisions, right? A food supply for 25 years. Not just that, though. You had the ability in between the walls to have all your agriculture and all your animals and so they just thought life was going to go on even though they had been besieged by Cyrus. Cyrus had been doing this off and on for 20 years. He hadn't gotten in yet. So this was no big worry to him. And then when he crossed the line of bringing the, the implements from the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had brought from the, from the Jewish temple, from Jerusalem, and used those as part of his party supplies, um, drinking from those, getting drunk, all kinds of defilement of God's things. Then, all of a sudden, you have a hand appear. You begin to write on the wall. That begins to write on the wall. And made him so afraid, this image, that his knees knocked. It says that his, his joints and his hips came undone. In other words, he, just, he couldn't stand up. He, he could do nothing under his own power to stand up anymore. Um, call all the wise men, all the Chaldeans, just as the same. We've seen this rep or repeated over and over through Daniel so far. They always call the people they think are wise and, and understanding, and they can't, they can't give dreams, they can't interpret dreams, they can't do anything that they're supposed to be able to do. They're not really in touch with their gods because their gods don't exist. And then they bring Daniel. Just don't go to Daniel first. I don't get it, but hey, you know, he proved himself from the beginning. I don't, you just call this guy in, but they don't. Uh, the queen mother, basically, who was not at the party, but heard what was going on and came in, told Belshazzar about Daniel, and has Daniel, he has Daniel called in and tells him, if you will tell me what that means, the writing on the wall there, then... Uh, You'll be third ruler in the nation. We'll put a purple robe on you. We'll put a gold chain around your neck. You'll be number three guy. And Daniel's response to that is, you can keep that, give that to whoever you want to. He, he'd already held the position even higher than that. In fact, he'd held the position basically that Belshazzar had. Number two in the land for Nebuchadnezzar. And Belshazzar was just number two to his father, who just wasn't there. Didn't like Babylon, didn't want to be in Babylon, so he would go off and he just gave Babylon to Belshazzar. Daniel gives the meaning, the interpretation. This is in verse 26. This is the interpretation of each word. Many, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain and Darius the Mede received 
the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So we have Darius now on the scene. Now it's said that when Cyrus came in a few days after the city had been taken over, that Daniel met him at the gate with the book of Isaiah and showed him where Isaiah had not just prophesied about this event, but had named him specifically as coming in and being the one to take over Babylon. And that it had so impressed Cyrus that obviously they didn't just sack the city. They didn't do anything to Daniel. I mean, here, putting that gold chain around him, direct decorating him like he's a noble, that makes him a target when the, when the overthrowing company, our country comes in. And I've awful, also just wondered why, outside of just God's hand, they didn't take out Daniel. Because that would be the norm. I'm sure everybody in that banquet hall, not just, uh, not just Belshazzar, but everybody there, all the lords, all the nobles, I'm sure they were pretty much all slain. That's what you did. You came in, you took out everybody who was of real any importance. Whether you, 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 know, you slaughtered them or you took them into captivity, whatever it was. But they didn't do that with Daniel. So I think that part, partly uh, that, that information from Josephus, that that's what happened, that probably spared him. The other thing is, is that Daniel had, for all those years with Nebuchadnezzar, been one of, one of or the chief diplomat, really, to the rest of the kingdom. And they had dealings with the Medes and Persians. And they had trade agreements with them. So these guys may have known who Daniel was. He may have been the one who set it up and did the interacting with these guys. So when they came in and they found him, they spared him because they liked him. Everybody liked Daniel. Well, I shouldn't say everybody. Everybody but the other wise men liked Daniel. The other guys, like we're going to see today, are always trying to get his position, always trying to take him down. But anybody who was of any real value in the kingdom liked Daniel except for Belshazzar, who had just disregarded him altogether. Darius, there's some controversy. This is one of the places where the skeptics or the critics will say, there's no mention of anybody named Darius anywhere in secular history in that time period. Well, the word Darius or the name Darius means the scepter bearer, bearer or the one who bears the scepter. It may have just been a title. And they think that a man named, let's see if I can get this right, Gabaro was the one who was actually in place that, that um, Cyrus had set in place in Babylon to rule. And we know from secular history that this man was there. And we also know that he was 62 years old. So it's likely that that's who it was. Just under the title, Darius, scepter bearer. <coughs> so don't let things like that trip you up or make you doubt God's word just because secular history can say or secular people can say well they say there's no record of the guy well there is if you look into the details not only that they have still hundreds of tablets and, and cylinders that they haven't interpreted yet from the digs in, in old Babylon so again it, it could still turn up you know the it's been said that the, uh, the archaeologist spade usually catches up with the Bible. You know, it, it, it never disproves the Bible. So it's just a matter of time if we're here that long. So, so verse 1 of chapter 6. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps. Uh, to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, uh, that the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. All right, so, big setup, right? In, in organized government. And you're going to do it fast because you, you got to maintain your kingdom. You don't want to have a weak moment. So <coughs> over these provinces, 120 provinces, and there were at least 100 in Babylon before Medes and Persians took over. So you've extended the kingdom some. Uh, be, besides that, it's, it's a lot bigger than, or not a lot bigger, but it's bigger than it was before uh, Nebuchadnezzar, when Nebuchadnezzar had it. So satraps basically are just princes. These are guys who are just going to govern or rule over their, their little 
provinces, their areas, governors, so to speak. And then you have the three um, governors that are set over them. So you don't have 120 guys coming to the king all the time. <coughs> they can split the kingdom up into, into you know, 40 guys each, and they can just answer to one of these governors. And when it says that Daniel is one, it, also, it, it could also have been, or, or it should be more likely, he was the one. He was the number one of the three already. He was considered among the three, but Darius, we see here, is getting ready to, or thinking about uh, making another position just for him and set him above the three. There would probably then be one that would replace him, but set him up into the number two, the number two position. So then it would be the 120 go to the three, the three go to Daniel, and Daniel goes to the king. Even less for him to have to worry about, right? Says so he distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. Now, remember, just as we talked about in the beginning of Daniel, and we carry, had carried on so far through, and, and you can apply this to Joseph too, he's the other standout in the Bible, that you can be in the service of people in this world. There are a lot of people who wish they didn't have to go out and work for a secular company or go out and work for, you know, whatever, another boss who's not a Christian, no matter how big or small the company is. But here you can still honor God. And, and if it's a wise person running the, the company or who is in charge over you directly, and you are there to honor God, and you are working as one who honors God, and you are living your life not just in work, but outside of work in a manner which honors God, if they're a wise person, even if they don't know Jesus, they're going to trust you. You're going to prove to be trustworthy. You're going to prove to be faithful. And that's what Daniel is. And we're going to find that he's faithful, not just to the king, but to God, even under pressure. So even there, you got Daniel's got this time period that he's serving with Darius, again, being promoted, being lifted up, being honored by the king, has the king's attention, and the other guys can't stand it. They can't get away with anything, first of all. When you have somebody who's in a position of, of any kind of power, of any kind of authority, big or small, if that person will stay loyal to the company, then the people under them don't get away with anything. You know, you don't get away with put things in your pockets and walking off. You don't get away with not showing up for work. You don't get away with stuff. And, and they don't like it. And then there's always those who want power. And they're, they're not there to be, uh, to actually help the king or to be a great advisor to the king. They're there to get the attention. You know, it looks good if you sit next to the king, to everybody else. You, we're worried about being seen. We're worried about, uh, look at me, look at what I do. Look at who I rub shoulders with. Look at, you know, it's not about that. And they're looking at Daniel and, and assuming that he has that attitude. But we find here, it says he had an excellent spirit within him. So he wasn't being arrogant. He wasn't being haughty about it. He wasn't saying, look at me. He's just doing his job, going home and living a godly life at home too, we're going to find out. And they don't like it. And you're going to run into that. So you'll run into people who will look at you and say, man, what is different about you? And you can the open door opportunity to tell them about Jesus. And you're going to run into people who are going to say, I can't stand you. They, they compare themselves to you. They compare other people to you. Other people compare them, or they think everybody's comparing them to you, whether they are or not. Nothing's changed. Not in thousands of years. The attitudes of people haven't changed. And by this time you've had Daniel for most of the time there in charge of these guys, whether under Nebuchadnezzar or now under Darius. Well he's under well now he's under he's you know, in charge of the rulers and the in the government, but then before he was in charge of the, the advisors to the governors and the, the wise men, the Chaldeans, the astrologers, all of those guys. 
So, actually, if you think about it, he was the number one spiritual leader. Because the, the, the wise men, the, the, the Chaldeans, the, all those before the advisors to the king, mostly were spiritual advisors. That's why he called them in when he had dreams and, and that kind of thing, to, to interpret the dreams. Now he's in charge of government. So you can be both a godly spiritual leader. You can also be a godly person in government and, and, and be that and still serving a secular government. You know, I'm sure the, the Medes and Persians were far from being founded on godly principles. They were idolaters just like the Babylonians were. It would be really easy to just beat that horse right to death today, wouldn't it? That you can serve in government and be godly. You don't have to be compromised with the world. You don't have to, you don't have to play the games, all that. You can still be a godly person and be in government. Now, you have a big target on your back. But again, nothing's changed. Ever. And honestly... This is the same story from the garden. You have two people honoring God, in communion with God, doing what he wants them to do. You have one, Satan, who wants to take him down. And he accomplishes his goal. The next story, you have two brothers. One that honors God, is in communion with God, serving God, worshiping God. And the other who hates him for it because he has the favor of God. And he won't compromise. And on top of that, he loves his brother who hates him. Which enrages him even more to the point that he kills him. Nothing has changed. Since the fall, nothing has changed. So you either want to serve God and honor God and you're in communion with God. Or... You hate God and you hate everybody who has anything to do with him. And, and, you know, we can point it out until we're just tired of it, but is it not what we feel today? It's the same thing. Laws are made not to honor God anymore, but to tear him out and take down those who follow him and honor him. And those laws are more and more only applied to Bible believing Christians nobody's suing any Muslim bakeries or florists over same sex marriages and, and they won't do them there are people who have gone in posing as a, a, as a couple wanting to have a same sex marriage that have asked the Muslim bakeries will you provide her? no we're not going to provide a cake for that no, we won't come and bring the flowers to that. And nobody's going after them. Those videos are out there of them doing it. The, the, the same people who want to go after the Christian companies could very easily then walk in right behind these other people that are showing what happens. But they won't do it. In fact, they're probably the same people who would say that, you know, you're just an Islamophobe. Because you're pointing this out. You're proving your point. Listen, these laws are not made for people to have what they want to have, what they've always wanted to have. They've taken advantage of people who, who want those things, who want those relationships. They've taken advantage of them and they don't even know it. You know, they, they have them come to the rallies. They make them all these promises. You're going to be finally be able to just live out peacefully among the community and everybody's going to be accepting of you. And you have those who are implanted into it who are the ones who are, well, if you want to be politically correct, they're extremists. Who then go out and find the Christian communities and go out and try to bring the lawsuits and, and tie things up in court. And they've taken advantage of the people who are hurting, the people who really thought that that's what they wanted. 
And it's sad. I feel bad for the people who have been taken advantage of. I don't agree with their lifestyle. I will never agree with their lifestyle. It is against God. It is against his word. But they have been convinced that I hate them by the people who promote that. And they've been convinced that we should lose our churches, that we should lose our businesses by the people who have promoted the hate that didn't really exist. Well, I shouldn't say it didn't exist because it does. We see the same thing with racism being brought up in our country again. You have those who are just inciting everybody. To the point that nobody wants to listen. And it is the result of teaching our kids to react and not to think. They've accomplished what they wanted to accomplish since the 60s, 50s, 60s. And we can all, anybody who's a product of the public school, you can think back and you can think even day to day how you react to things. How often do you catch yourself just being instantly angry and spewing out how you feel instead of thinking the situation through? And we're all guilty of it. We need to be more like Daniel. We can face the heat. We can face the threat. Peacefully, honoring God, seeking to honor God. We can obey the laws of the land so far as they don't conflict with God. And what we're about to see here is not far from happening. As a matter of fact, you could say this is already happening in our military. With our military chaplains. To one degree. So verse 4 says, so the governor's and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find, or they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. So they couldn't find anything wrong with his work ethic and what he did. He was faithful to the king. And they couldn't find anything wrong with him personally. Yeah, he, he wasn't keeping a, a second wife in the basement or however, you know. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't doing anything wrong on a personal level. Everything about the man was not about himself but about honoring God. Everything. And so again, these people were looking to take him down. So verse 5, then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors, there's a lie, only two of the three, right? All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, the advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, the king Darius signed the written decree. So they're playing to his ego. Right? You're the king. Let's make a law. 30 days. Just 30 days. Nobody can petition another god. They can't pray to another god. And they can't even go petition another man. So listen, even if Daniel endures 30 days and doesn't get caught doing anything against his god, these guys got 30 days off. They can't even come to them. They've just ramped up the king's work for 30 days because now he's got to see everybody. But you know what? Again, now you're seeing no here, <laughs> come to think of it, some of our own political moves. And we're going to see it ad nauseum here in the next few months. 
where these, these political figures will be in the communities. Everybody come to me. Everybody talk to me. Open door policy as long as I'm standing in front of you. Anybody can ask me questions. Town hall meetings, we're going to have it all. Darius, this is what we'll do. We'll put you in front of the people for 30 days. Nobody to see anybody else. Nobody can pray to anybody else. Nobody can even ask any questions of anybody else. This will prove your wisdom and you are the king. It will set you above everybody. It, it'll impress the people. It's like, all right, good political move. Let's do this. Let's, let's really cement this kingdom down right now. And so he signs it into, into a decree. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar was king, Nebuchadnezzar could change his decrees. He didn't have anybody that he shared leadership with. He was the king, absolute power. He could make the law, he could take the law away. If these guys have pulled that with him, then, you know, when you get to the part where Darius wants to save Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar would have just said, listen, you ding-dongs, you just set me up, you're done. Who do you think you are? And take out my top guy and try to play to me to do that. Nebuchadnezzar could do that. In the Middle Persian Empire, you couldn't do that. The king made a decree, it stuck. Even the king couldn't change it. There's some shared leadership here. Cyrus isn't here. Cyrus is the king of the Middle Persian Empire. And Darius is a co king, co regent of the Middle Persian Empire. He can't change this. It's been said, it's done, not changing, right? Like calling balls and strikes in a baseball game. You can't change it. You've seen balls called strikes that were way outside of the strike zone, right, for you baseball people. Or people called safe that were clearly out. You know, there's a... a Tiger pitcher, believe it or not, had a, a no-hitter perfect game going a few years ago. Last out of the game. Last batter. Would have been the last batter. Clearly out at first base, and the guy called him safe, and they didn't change the ruling. You don't change the ruling in baseball. Clearly out. Umpire even apologized later. If I remember right, GM still gave the guy the Corvette because that was their thing. Man, a pitcher pitches a perfect game. Chevy gives him a free Corvette. Still gave him the Corvette. But in the record books, it still shows that he just pitched a no, he didn't even pitch a no hitter. Guy was safe at first. Ruined his perfect game, ruined his no hitter. You don't change. Well, in the Medo Persian guys, they didn't change. You did not change the decree. Not even the king could go against his own decree. Now they've got him. They've got the king and they've got Daniel. So, so now, Dan, you know, when, now when Daniel knew, key thing to remember there, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. They knew what to look for. They designed the law to catch him. You can't pray to your God. We know he's going to. Knew where to find him. And what we see here is some civil disobedience, isn't it? It says when Daniel knew it was signed. Law was written, law was signed, turned around, went home, opened his windows toward Jerusalem like he did every day. And three times that day, he got down on his knees and prayed. I know what this law is designed for. Let me help you out. If we found out today at the end of the service they made a law like that here in the law of our land, who would be back here tonight? where they could find us, openly praying. We could throw these two garage doors up, turn the speakers on. 
Who would do that? And I don't want to see any hands. That's a question to be answered in your heart because I'm telling you guys, this is happening. And it's not really new. Pastors are being persecuted for reading Romans chapter 1. For not even reading it, just putting it on the screen. In Canada, a guy went to jail for that. Just put it on the screen, he didn't even read it. Hate speech. Don't think, listen, there are active people actively trying to make the Bible hate speech. Prosecutable hate speech. We're not a big church. What happens in the day when one of those laws passes? If it passes in the middle of the week, you guys won't see me on Sunday because they're going to find me here that day. It's coming. You know, last week I, I told you guys, they're, they're, they are coming. It's coming. You're going to lose jobs. You're not just going to lose friends. You're not just going to lose family relationships. You're going to lose jobs. You're going to lose ways of life because of these laws. They're serious about it. We can no longer look and say, listen, this is America. We're all based on freedom. We have the Constitution. Listen, they wipe their feet on our Constitution every day. They don't care about that. They openly say they don't care about that. They're looking into the camera and telling you, you need to change the way you think and act and believe and quit clinging to God. They're looking into the camera and telling you that. And they are making laws. You better pay attention. I don't want to be politically involved. I don't want to listen to all that. It's just a bunch of rhetoric, a bunch of this, a bunch of that. It's all fixed anyways, blah, 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 blah. I get it. I understand that. That's kind of how I feel too. But I'm telling you, you better be ready. The next question is, though, when they make the law, is there enough evidence to convict you? Will they know? Will the people at work be like, all right, he's a Christian. She's a Christian. Will they be able to do that? Or are you blending in with everybody? You know, there are countries where you can't pray in the Middle East. You can't pray to God. China. I've heard stories of, of people going to meet with, with the underground church in China, and they sit in restaurants, and to pray over the meals, they just look at each other with their eyes open like, like they're just talking. Because they watch them. They're always being watched. India, Pakistan. You guys, it's all over the world. It's only a matter of time before it comes here. Our own chaplains in our military, you will not pray in the name of Jesus. We have lawsuits, still battles in court going on about that. Chaplains being ordered to take Bibles away from the soldiers in the Middle East because they're handing them out to the local people. It's happening. This isn't a warning anymore. It's here. Be ready. Daniel made it easy for him. He goes, as was his custom, this wasn't just, hey, I'm going to 
wave a flag over here, hey, I'm going to demonstrate his regular everyday routine. He knew it was enough. Go open the doors, open the windows, get on your knees and pray. Three times that day, prayed and gave thanks in the face of what's coming. Not a prayer of panic. Imagine, Lord, thank you for putting me here. Led away as a captive in his teenage years, away from family, identity changed, everything. Lord, thank you for this life you've given me. Maybe he's praying like this is his last day. Lord, thank you for finding me worthy to be used all these years with these kings. Not just a prayer of a, uh, not just a prayer list, but a prayer of thanksgiving. And we're we not taught that all through the Bible. You know, Paul tells us, make, make all your prayers and your supplications with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. He, you should go to God absolutely when you are desperate. Things look bad. Things are desperate. You need to cry out to the Lord. You need to change your ways. You need to, you need to heal. Whatever it is, you go to him. You pour out your heart. You're going to pour your heart out like David. But if you read through the Psalms and you go just through the Psalms where he's saying, Lord, avenge me, bash out their teeth, break their arms. Those are kind of fun to pray. Sometimes you feel like praying those. But the next psalm is going to be, I'm telling you, a psalm of praise and worship and thankfulness and recognition of who God was. David didn't just stay on the, on the desperation train. He, he, he was praying with thanksgiving too. Worshipful prayers. In the face of everything that was going on around him. Paul, after the list that you will find in his writings of all the things that he went through, still saying, pray like me with thanksgiving. Yes, pour out your heart before God. Yes, trust him to be your provider. Trust him to be your healer. Go before him with all those things. But do it with thanksgiving for the situation, no matter what you're in now. Still be thankful to him. We have everything to be thankful for. If we are a born-again Christian, you have so much to be thankful for. What we have here on this earth does not compare to what we have that we have inherited. I don't care if you're one of the people getting in with your tail feathers smoking. you are still got a lot more to be thankful for. You're not going to be eternally separated from God. If that's all you got. And listen, maybe you're like, man, I've wasted my life even as a believer. I can look back on some years that were completely wasted. Yeah, but you don't know. And I'm going to die today, and I've just wasted all my life. Well, get busy. You got the rest of whatever God's got for you to honor him. But I'm telling you, even if a person doesn't become a Christian, until their dying breath. They can still have a great reward in heaven. How can that be? Look at the thief on the cross. The thief that hung next to Jesus. His dying breath. He defends him against the other thief. And he says, Lord, just remember me when you come into your throne. Who doesn't know those words that's been in the, in the church for more than a year? If you've sat through an Easter service, if you sat through anything that talks about the crucifixion, you've heard that that man said those words. His words, his dying breath has affected so many people because it's given them hope in the last minutes of their life. You think he doesn't have any reward for that? 
for that willingness at the very last of his life to speak in favor of, the, of, of God, to speak in favor of Jesus. And it was public. There he is, hanging up there, dying for his public sins, dying publicly. And he speaks words of faith publicly, his last words, as far as we know. And it's Jesus' response. Today you will be with me in paradise. Those words should echo in all of our ears. Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. Hey, listen. You're going to be with me. I've forgiven you. You're going to be with me. Yeah, but I keep blowing it. Yeah, I know. You, do, but you keep coming back to me, so you're going to be with me. You're going to be with me. Daniel's got to know that. Whatever they do to me, when I, when I go against this, whatever they do to me, Lord, I know I'm coming to be with you. So verse 12, they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, somebody comes into your presence. The day that you sign a law, no, you, you've made a decision, this is the way we're going, somebody comes back to you and says, all right, didn't you do this? Now you know you've been set up. Right? You know you've been set up. Darius knows he's been set up. What are you getting at? You know? That would be me. Listen, you bunch of jackals, what are you doing? What did you get me to do? How did you set me up? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king that, Dar that, Dan that Daniel, that Daniel, who is one of the captives of Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Why didn't the king, the king doesn't argue, doesn't call Daniel in and say, is this true? It's not like when Nebuchadnezzar called in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I think the king knows. He didn't think about it when he was signing the law. He wasn't thinking. Just, oh yeah. Get caught up in the whole thing. Good political scheme. Get me in front of the people, right? Oh. He didn't think about Daniel. And you hear the hate. That, that Daniel. That Daniel. One of the captives from Judah. One of those slaves. I mean, they've already demoted him. One of those slaves from Judah does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to be delivered or to deliver him and he labored till go the going down of the sun to deliver him trying to find the loophole gotta be a loophole something I wrote here has gotta be there's got to be a loophole so I can save my friend there's gotta be a way so then these men approached the king and said to the king no O king that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. I'm telling you, these guys, if it's me, they're this close. You keep challenging me and what I know, I mean, seriously, you're going to feed the lions first. <laughs> you know, I'm about done with you guys.
But he can't just do that. They kind of got him. This is public. As much as you have the, the, the satraps, all the, all the princes, all these people that are in government, that are, it's not even just the other two. It's not even just 120, I don't think, that are coming. This is, this is everybody involved in the government. These are all the people that are going to go out and say, this is what the king did. And they can't do anything about it. He can't do anything about it. Verse 16, so the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the lions. But the king spoke to Daniel. Spoke saying to Daniel, your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. So a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den and the king sealed it uh, with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. So he does. I'm going to go through with it. I can't back down from this. I'm going to take care of this. Bring Daniel in. Then they throw him in. Now this is a pit. These pits had to be dug fairly deep because lions jump pretty high. They heard a story about a zoo in New York somewhere that they kept finding pieces of animals in the lion's cage. They had a lion that was jumping over an eight foot wall. Grabbed a zebra, jumped back over that wall into his own con confine with the zebra. That's power and that's a real good ability to jump. So they had to dig these pits pretty deep. And they have found these, these pits where they know that they were at. And they would be like two compartments. So they could put them all in one compartment and, and drop a gate or a door or whatever. And then they could clean out the one. And then when it was time, they'd just throw somebody or something in, open the door, and the lions would come in. And they shut the door behind them. And then they could get into the other one and take care of whatever they need to over there. And, and it, they were raised to be fierce. And they didn't feed them much. And now it's, you know, for those of you who know the rest of this story, that's one of the charges. Well, you know, Darius did find a way to spare Daniel. He just stuffed him full of, stuffed them lions full of food, overfed them, and then they, they didn't feel like eating. Well, we'll see why that can't be true in a minute. But the other thing is, <clears throat> they're cats. Cats tear things apart for no reason. You don't have to be hungry to grab a mouse and kill it. It, all it has to do is move. <laughs> so they take this 85, 90 year old man, says they cast him into the pit. And you just, you know, here's a rope, will lower you down, threw him in. That's, that's a, a, quite a fall. And then they put a rock over the top of this thing, and the king sealed it with his signet, but not just with his signet, all the signets of his lords. Your name is going to be on this execution. This is a public record now of who set this whole thing up. Number one. Number two, I think the rock was put on there not so that, and sealed, not just so that the lions couldn't get out or that nobody could come and rescue Daniel, but so nobody could come and kill Daniel and make sure that he was dead. This was sealed up. This was Darius' only way to protect Daniel beyond that. As long as God delivered him from the lions in the pit, Darius has delivered him from the lions outside of the pit. The ones who would just come and make sure that he was dead. And Darius, Darius has talked to Daniel. See, this is what I'm saying. Dan, he, he had to have just completely forgotten about Daniel in the moment that he did this whole thing, got caught up in the in the idea, and because he cries up, the, the God, your God, whom you serve continually, will deliver you. 
And, and certainly they know the stories. Daniel had a reputation throughout all the kingdom when Nebuchadnezzar was in charge. And if, if these guys had any interaction with Daniel or with, with Babylon before they became enemies, then they knew of Daniel. They maybe knew of the stories of Daniel. The stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar made decrees about their God. You won't speak evil against their God or I'm going to burn your house down. I'm going to chop you into little pieces. Nebuchadnezzar, the man of great extremes. Falls on his face in front of Daniel. Don't speak evil. Has his own time of going mad and insane until he recognizes God and then writes a song or a psalm very similar to what we see from other people in, in the Bible. It compares very well to Hannah's we saw on, on Wednesday night because we were doing uh, First Samuel on Wednesday night. And the, the song that she writes after, uh, after Samuel is born and she brings him back to the temple to dedicate him, some of the same phrases, some of the same things are, are in hers are in Nebuchadnezzar's. So verse 18, now the king went to the, to the palace, or to his palace, and spent the night fasting, and no musicians uh, were brought before him. Also, his sleep went from him. So he's pacing the floor, man. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to hear anybody. You know, these, are, these are things probably happen nightly. Obviously food. But he doesn't want to eat. And you've probably been there. Distraught. Desperate. I can't even think of taking food right now. Or, or you've dealt with other people who are in that kind of position where they've, they've lost a loved one and, and they just don't think to eat. And you say, hey, listen, you, you need to eat. Right? You, you try to minister to them that way. You need to make sure you're eating. Not the king. The king's like, no, nothing. I don't need music to try to put me to sleep. I don't want any food to try to put me to sleep. I'm not sleeping. I can't sleep. I'm not doing any of this. It says, Then the king rose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to, him, or when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke to, saying to Daniel, Daniel, Servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Now he's pretty confident, trying to encourage Daniel at the beginning of this. Your God will deliver you, Daniel. Your God, whom you serve continually, he's got this. Don't worry, Daniel. Now it's been a night. Daniel, Daniel, tell me. A lamenting voice. Did your God, whom you serve continually, did he deliver you from the lions? And the pause. And the wait for a response. And maybe now, at this point, he's had a whole night to just be stirred up about the whole thing. He's not really expecting anything. Right? And then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel to shut the mouths, or shut the lions' mouths, so that they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. So I honored my God and king. I didn't pray to him to be against you. And, and, and Darius knows. He knows. He's prospering because this man serves his God. His kingdom is established because he serves his God. Probably standing there when Daniel said, Look, Cyrus, Isaiah, our prophet, wrote about you 120 years before you were born. The details of your attack on the city were written before you were born. 
And Darius must have been standing right there. He is impressed with Daniel. He's impressed with his God. It doesn't appear to be enough to have his own heart and mind changed like Nebuchadnezzar's was. Because he's still your God who you serve for continually. But my God sent his angel. May have been another pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. May have been an angel. I think it's probably the same one who was in the furnace, the fourth man in the furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Sent his angel to come and shut the, mouth, the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me. Because I was found innocent before him and also, O oh king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. Right? Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to come out. These guys, they don't have a hair singed. Their clothes don't smell like smoke. Nothing. No harm. No surface burns. No any. I mean, it killed the, the elite fighters that threw them in. So hot, it killed them on the spot. But they walk out and there's nothing wrong with them. Same deal here. Daniel's pulled up out of the lion's den. Even being thrown down in the pit, he didn't get hurt. The lions haven't scratched him. Nothing. Nothing's found on him. Why? Because he believed in his God. Listen, you may feel like the whole world is against you. Don't you stop believing in God. He knows where you're at. He knows what you're going through. He has not forgotten you. And if you seek to honor him, you will come out of whatever trial that you're going through right now because he'll go through it with you. You'll come out unhurt. How many times can you not think back over things that you've gone through? Hard times, hard days, hard weeks, hard years, and you come out of it and you're going, you know what? God sustained me. God strengthened me. He increased my faith. I am better now when I came out than I was when I went into that trial. And in the very end, even if you die a martyr, our brothers and sisters are being martyred all over the world right now. Even if you die a martyr, you will stand in front of Jesus completely healed. New body. New everything. On the day of our resurrection, we're not going to come out of the ground looking like zombies. We're going to come up with a brand new body. Eyes that will be able to see him just like John saw him in Revelation. In all the different facets from fiery eyes and, and chest of bronze all the, in his glory to the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world to the one on the back of the horse who has got the king of kings and the lord of lords and the word of God coming from his mouth. We'll be able to see him just like John did. Our new eyes will be able to take in him. Isn't that amazing? And when they say, What happened? My God delivered me. You'll pass through a fire. You're going to pass through a fire that's going to refine you. All the junk all the dumb things we did, all the things we did for ourselves and took honor for instead of giving it to God, all that's going to be burnt out. And when we come out of that fire, we won't be destroyed. We'll be refined. We'll be perfect.
nothing on us of any kind of injury. No trauma, no bruises, no scratches, no scars from our past. Completely made new. Daniel's being taken out of the ground. I think, and this is just me. I've not heard anybody else say this, but I think you're looking at a picture of the resurrection. He's pulled out. There's nothing wrong with him. No injury at all. Because he believed in his God. Verse 24, and the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they, set, and they cast them into the den of lions. Them, their children, their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. All those guys who sealed that stone, all those ones who put their signet in there with the king, all gone. And you say, man, that's kind of drastic. Throw wives and children. Yeah, well, back then, a king didn't leave anybody to take revenge on somebody or for somebody that he had killed. So, you offended the king and you lost your life, your whole family died. There wouldn't be somebody left to survive to take revenge later. The king didn't want to have to rule looking over his shoulder all the time. <clears throat> and that right there takes care of the whole Darius overstuffed the lion so they wouldn't eat Daniel all of these people they don't even make it to the bottom of the pit before they're dead these ravenous lions breaking their bones and, and into tear them into pieces before they ever even make it to the bottom of the pit. Then Darius wrote, <clears throat> to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar's made decrees like this too, right? For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is, one, is the one which shall not be destroyed. His dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. That's the only statement right there that makes me think possibly Darius, this Darius, converted like Nebuchadnezzar did. Maybe. Because he's not speaking it as just Daniel's God. Everyone must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, but then he gives kind of the personal touch to it, for he is the living God. And steadfast forever. Darius is prophesying. He's not just He's not just giving honor and glory to the God of Daniel, the one who rescued Daniel, but he's prophesying here. He is steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one that shall not be destroyed. Maybe he knows, maybe Daniel has told him about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Right? And the rock that comes in and smashes the ten toes in the feet of the, of the idol, or the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw. And now Darius has seen with his own eyes the deliverance of this God. And his dominion shall endure to the end. Listen, that's the same as saying he is the king of kings and he is the lord of lords. His dominion will endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. 
who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. He serves these guys now. From a desperate moment because of a, a law, a law of man that is temporary. And because of his willingness to stand in the face of that, he has shown the futility of man's law and he's shown the futility of men's actions toward God and his people. It is futile. They may one day execute me, but I will come up out of the ground if they do. I know it. The new, the new Jesus taught it. When, when, when Lazarus had died, and Jesus goes and he sees Martha, and Martha says, I know I'll see my brother in the resurrection. Right? That, was, that was her answer. She knew about the resurrection. She had faith in that, that God was going to deliver. Deliver us from death. This is the picture we have, guys. We have been delivered from death, and we have been delivered from men been delivered from the world system and from death itself. There is a time for civil disobedience, but you notice it was peaceful. It wasn't violent. He didn't rally an army. He didn't rally a mob. He just went home and prayed. So I will say, in that respect, be careful what you get involved with. Go home and pray. Come to church and pray. Drive in your car, pray. Keep your eyes open, but pray. like me most days if you drive more than 15 minutes you got to pray anyways because of the other people on the road you're praying similar lord deliver me from men and death listen guys it's going to get tough it is it's going to get hard it's going to get desperate but we serve the god who rules everything and it won't always be this way for us. We are overcomers because he is an overcomer. He's already overcame the world. We overcome. Forget about inheriting from men. You have inherited from God. You are a child of the king. You are a servant of the king. We need to live like it. We need to act like it. We need to talk like it. So that others will come to know him. Let's pray. Father, I do pray for, pray for our nation. And pray for your church. Well, your church would be strong in the face of danger wherever we are. Not just here in our land where it seems to be starting, but all over the world where it is already full on persecution. Lord, at this day you would fill your servants with your spirit, that your gospel would be proclaimed throughout all of the world without fear knowing in our hearts that you have secured our place with you, knowing in our hearts that we will see you face to face, that we will rise again. Lord, you know 
you know I hope I'm one of the ones that, that is raptured out, that doesn't see death that way. But if that's what you have for me, I trust in you. And I pray that for everybody. Lord, forgive us for our lack of faith. May we be more like our children who just believe just because you're God. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us for choosing to work through us and for calling us by your name. In Jesus' name, amen.